Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I've got three questions, but they're all different guys. <laughs> and I said that specifically for you. <laughs> okay. The first one is, sorry, it's Paul from from City Fire Joburg. The first one is for Chris. I think we've got probably a gigawatt and a half's worth of diesel gen installed in the country. How do we get that into the system? If you've got any ideas there. Um, at the moment, we've got to interrupt supply and switch over to diesel. So there might be some technical things we need to do to make that work, but would the regulator entertain the idea? The next question is for Stefan. Are there any instances where, instead of the storage being co-located with the renewables, you have a deal where the, the renewable is, is, is in a suitable place for the renewable, but the storage is linked to it on paper and put into some part of the network? In other words, the storage and the generator, the renewable energy generation, aren't physically co-located so that you can take advantage of storage to, to alleviate network issues somewhere else. Are there any deals that link the two on paper? So um, which Stefan now? What the first it? Stefan. No? That's Stefan, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then the last question was for other Stefan. Um, most gas seems to be available on a take or pay, certainly the piped gas. Um, is that true around the world? And if so, how do you balance just using the gas on odd days and what happens on the days in between that you don't need it? How, how do you mitigate against those costs? Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Uh, there was a hand here. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Carl from DID. Um, questions to our storage experts. Uh, you briefly mentioned uh, using hydrogen, um, electricity through electrolysis over to hydrogen. Uh, do we have a rand per kilowatt hour costs rough estimate with, on, on that process? And then just secondly, um, is, there, is it technically very difficult to convert our current gas infrastructure to run on hydrogen? Thanks. Thank you for a precise question. Third hand over there. Etienne Rubbers from Renew E. Chris, I've got a question for you. Um, I've got a solar panel at my home for about five kilowatts. And I've also installed a uh, 200 kilowatt unit at a commercial factory. And I haven't got any approvals from anyone for that. And I'd just like to know if I'm breaking the law. <laughs> Etienne, you're very brave. <laughs> There was a hand there, gentlemen, and then the lady, oh. Okay, the lady's got the mic, let her go, and then we'll close it off. Good afternoon, my name is Desne Leafcamp, I'm with NG. Sorry, ma'am, I didn't get your name? Desne. Desne. Chris, if I heard you correctly, um, you made reference to the grid code and the possibility that it would have to be amended to accommodate battery storage sometime in 2020. Granted, we don't know when the RFP for round five is going to come out and whether that RFP will include storage, um, which I think most of us in this room hope it will. How do you see the timeline for the whole consultation process that will be required um, to finalize the amendment to the grid code with a round five? Thank you, ma'am. Last one for this uh, round. Hi, my name is Alan, I'm an independent. My question is for Chris. You mentioned earlier as the regulator you implement government's uh, policy. Having seen the paradigm shift in the proposals to clean energy going forward over the next 20 years, do you see government embracing that view? I wish to thank all the questions. Um, ask us a question in such an English term. Um, for your precise questions, thank you so much. Now, dun, 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 jeopardy. <laughs> Chris, I'm going to join you there and give you some concern. You've got three questions to you. Uh, Stefan, you've got one. Um, did you have one? Okay. And I think you have one, but maybe you don't. Um, and Stefan, you have I've got three one. answers there. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Chris, are you ready? The first one from. Um, Paul, yes. Um, Paul had three questions and you had one. Okay, so Paul, I think the, f the first thing that comes to mind, given the 
the, the presentations today, today is do we want more diesel gen in the system? Okay, um, I'm not sure, are they just diesel generators or are they also uh, capable of running on gas? Um, I think currently, if I'm correct, they are just your standby generation around the country for the municipalities, uh, and they're not technically connected to the grid permanently, as you said. Right? Um, so given the current regulations, if you wanted to connect them permanently to the grid with a, a, an automatic cutover, um, and this is even with that amended schedule two that the ministers published, you would need to to get a uh, what's the word? A, a deviation from the minister. Um, I think uh, what did they mention when they? Uh, so I haven't. I wasn't there when they they they, they announced the RFP, but they, they are talking about the short term um, short term kind of procurements, etc. That they need to be able to stabilize the system in the short term. There may be options there. If they're talking about a, a medium-term power purchase program, it might not be a permanent thing, but you might be able to participate in something like that, depending on what technologies they're looking at. And that's really a policy thing. Uh, from a regulation perspective, if you're permanently connected to the grid and you're over a certain, I think it's over 10 megawatts, you need to then be licensed. And to do that, um, let me think. If you're selling to yourself, it's okay. You can probably get something, I suspect. If you're trying to sell into the grid, then it requires the minister to make a determination. And I hope that answers that. Uh, what is the second one? <laughs> Do we need to call the police? Um, so, so, so the first, uh, it's called the licensing and exemption uh, regulations that the minister published. Who is this? This is Etienne, right? Yeah. Um, and those still stand because we haven't processed the amendment yet. In terms of the current regulation, actually all home solar systems should actually be registered. But I, I mean, DOE or the Minister of Energy, Mineral Resources and Energy did realize that that's not practical. So the amendment that they gazetted for public consultation says all of those are exempt. So if you've got a home solar system, you don't need to be registered, um, or you won't need to be. So we've put that out. As I said, we can't. Uh, we can't just take what the, the DOE gives us and then say we concur. So we put that out for consultation. I don't know if, if, if people have actually seen that consultation paper. The, the comments closed, I think it was at the end of May. And we're busy now setting up the public hearing process, after which we should be able to concur or indicate to the minister where it is that we feel we should amend even more on, on, on that schedule. So the, the five kilowatts, um, yeah, you're not strictly legal, but I don't think anyone's going to do anything to you. And by the time they do, uh, the other schedule will probably be uh, promulgated, and then you'll be clear anyway. So uh, the, the commercial one, though, that's another issue. Um, you didn't indicate what it's used for. So if it's similar to what Paul indicated, it's a standby uh, system for when there are, for example, um, outages and you then cut over to that system, then you're fine. But if it's permanently connected to the grid, such as uh, it feeds into the system while you're drawing power from the grid, or it comes in automatically, then actually you need to be um, currently licensed. In the future, it will be registered. So that's not strictly legal either. But as I said, uh, we're almost done with the, the amended regulations. and. Uh, so I didn't get your full name and, and <laughs> 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 so, Okay, uh, and the third one is about the grid code, battery storage, hopefully round five will and then us about you know the grid code requirements, etc. Um so so we have a, a grid code advisory committee that works on these things on the grid code. Um, and they have indicated they will probably draft uh, publish a draft early next year um, for consultation. But we work quite closely. So for example, if the IPP office were the ones to do the procurement for a, a battery storage uh, capacity, uh, we actually talked to them. And if their timelines were such that we needed to bring that forward, then we could do that. <coughs> it's just that's the current timeline they're working to. Um, I'm actually wondering if they would have an RFP out by then anyway, sort of early next year. But but we address that as we go, and, and if they need guidance on 
on what the requirements may well be, then we will supply that to them. Um, but the NERSA processes are such that when we do uh, perform what they call an administrative action, we have to consult the public, um, and we can follow two avenues. When we consult, we can either, if it's something really we feel is quite substantial, we can do a 30-day uh, comment period and then we do a public hearing, or if it's something really urgent and it's not really that substantial, we can do what is called the 14-day notice and comments. So we, we publish it for 14 days, we get the comments in, and then we can finalize the message. There was a fourth question. Yes, this is just from Alan. Um, okay, so I, yeah, I don't really want to talk about what I think government will do. Um, but, but I think if you look at the IRP, you can see there is a shift towards clean energy, uh, but also gas. And I guess the question is, where will we find the gas? Um, I just think, you know, personally as a South African, I wouldn't like to be dependent on, on gas from a neighbor, given all the political issues in, in, in our region, uh, where that is actually a pillar of our supply. You know, so, so that can be affected. It's the same as the, the, um, the Inga project. I think those are the issues. If that forms a base, part of your base, and you have these political issues that then uh, prevent you from getting supply or something happens, then it actually can destroy the economy. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, and there was a question again for Stefan. It's um, just, just, I mean, as I understand, storage is, is needed for the flexibility to integrate renewables into the grid. The, the, the logic is that it's probably closed and it's in conjunction with the new renewables that you've been into place. You're asking if, if, if it can be separate or on, on that basis. I mean, obviously if it makes commercial sense and there's not losses and, and you can do it on that basis, no reason why we wouldn't be able to support something. Like that. It just has to make commercial sense compared to having it closer to your source. But you can answer that better. Yeah, the only reason, for, sorry, before I start, I'd just like my uh, grid operator to stand up so we can give her a round of applause. <laughs> I also just wanted to point out that grid systems operation uh, generally uh, is staffed by females because people have to be able to multitask in that particular <laughs> position. Uh, but thank you so much. Okay, so, so the reason people build storage at a solar or a wind site is to play the arbitrage, arbitrage game. So you sell electricity into the grid at different time of use tariffs. And if the uh, time of use tariff peaks in the late afternoon and the wind's blowing in the middle of the night and you're getting a low tariff, you take that wind and stick it into the <coughs> battery and release it into the grid during a high tariff time. So that's its main purpose of being positioned at the actual source. If, of course, you put it in a municipal uh, situation and you give access to that battery to the municipality or, in fact, to the system operator, they can use it for a whole cascading number of reasons. It can be used for frequency regulation. Not that the one on the, the, the wind farm or the solar farm can't be used for frequency regulation, but you then have to give control of that battery to the system operator. And if you're looking mainly to arbitrage uh, tariffs, then you can't relinquish control to someone else. So these, these, these control issues here um, in, in terms of how best to position it. But clearly, in a, in a thing like city power, you could uh, use it if, you, if you're having uh, congestion being able to feed a particular suburb at peak time at night, but in the middle of the night, no one's using any electricity. You could obviously have a battery uh, there that could be charged up and could release uh, and open up that bottleneck when you were battling to supply that particular region. And de facto, then, you would be taking, uh, taking advantage of charging it during low tariff times as city power from ESCOM and releasing it into those uh, distribution areas at times when prices are much higher. So you would get double or triple advantage out of it effectively. Deferment of putting in more grid, um, opening up the bottlenecks and also arbitraging on behalf of the municipality. About storage, I see you've got five glasses here, but there's no water. Appropriating your own water. Stefan, is there a question to you? Uh, <coughs> yes. 
this one? Yes. Uh, I believe the question for me was the uh, how how this uh, flexible gas will work with minimum take or pay gas supply. Uh, it's a very good and relevant question in, in this topic, and, uh, and I think historically, gas suppliers, this comes from their expectation. They they have a, a production that uh, is simply base load. Developers who then uh, buy that gas simply have to go to the utility or the off-taker and say that this has to be passed through in the BPA through minimum take or pay, otherwise this is not bankable. Uh, obviously, if, if we have more renewables and there's going to be more fluctuations in the grid, utilities are going to start saying, no, this, this doesn't work anymore. We need to be able to dispatch when, when the power is needed and to be switched off when, when it's not needed. Uh, I think there's been a lot of development in the gas sector, uh, especially LNG side, because this was typically the way LNG was done uh, many years ago and, and up, to, up to fairly recently, that the production of LNG was done in massive scale under very long 20-year contracts uh, supplying base load capacity, and the off-taker had to simply buy all of it. But since then, uh, I think uh, there's been much more flexibility in, in the LNG uh, side uh, partly driven by the fact that off-takers are, are more and more becoming traders, so they buy and sell this LNG on the spot market, and the contracts also from the production side is, uh, is more and more, the trend is to become more short-term contracts. 20-year uh, contracts are not that common. Uh, today there's 10-year uh, contracts, 5-year contracts, and even less. So, I think the, the market is already developing towards uh, this kind of, um, uh, let's say, uh, business model. And from, uh, from the, the IPPs and off-takers point of view, uh, I think what you, what you will see that we, we saw in these kind of models that we've done for the, for the power grids is that you can never predict the dispatch for the next couple of hours or, 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 or even day. But what you can do is that you can be fairly certain that there will be a, a pattern on a monthly basis that you, you can fairly accurately decide that, okay, on each month we will roughly dispatch so and so many gigawatt hours of, of electricity and we'll need that much of gas. Uh, but for intraday, you, this is, this is uh, where you need the flexibility. So you have, you have uh, then LNG or, or gas storage technologies to, to manage that short-term uh, variation. But uh, even on the longer term, uh, I would say on the contracting side, uh, through traders, uh, you, you also have a lot more flexibility there. So I think that's, that's sort of the trend that we, we observe, and, and uh, I see it's, it would work very well here in Africa and South Africa as well. Thanks very, very much. Uh, Chris, I see, um, yeah, there was a song that you said. <coughs> Fill up the table, clear the empties. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, there was a question from Carl around storage. Will you answer it, Carl? Uh, not, yet. not yet. And you wanted who to answer it? I tried to not say the name because I couldn't remember the name, but I'm a gentleman in the white t shirts. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think I mentioned hydrogen. So first of all, let me just put a disclaimer in. I'm not a hydrogen expert. But the idea behind hydrogen generation is that the gas we require, and let's just stick with electricity generation at the moment, not other forms of mobility that might be enabled by hydrogen. We don't need a lot of gas in the modeling I've done. We need, remember, it was about 7% of the annual amount was the shortfall. So what we need is a lot of gas generate. We need a lot of gas generators or internal combustion engines that only operate for very short periods of time, 7% or something in the year. So the idea with the hydrogen from an economic point of view is to take surplus solar, and if you remember the, my graph that I showed where you had brown going into storage, green coming out of storage, the yellow of the solar was basically surplus or wasted. You would use that wasted renewable energy or, or surplus to do electrolysis and produce hydrogen. So you'd essentially be producing hydrogen at no cost of energy input. And whatever the economics are then, they're obviously going to be incredibly good if that is the case. 
and you would then use hydrogen to to operate your um, your, your your gas fleet when required. So you need quite a lot of storage capacity, which is why I like to actually put the gas under storage. And whether the gas is hydrogen or the other way to get hydrogen is stripping. You mix you mix methane with 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 water vapor and various things, and you strip out hydrogen from it. But the the bottom line is that you need to be able to store it and use it in bursts when you short. And that's the that's the, the, the take home. And the surplus, it turns out in the modeling I've done, the surplus renewable is about equal to the amount of, of hydrogen that you need. So you spill about 8% renewable and you need about 7% gas. So they kind of counterbalance each other. And it, and it works very well. And one, one last thing on that, because I'm talking about storage, is when we run our system, we always need about 15% in reserve. So if the demand is 31 megs, you need 34 and a half megs or whatever it is, in case something falls offline. And so you can regard your, your gas engine or your gas turbine fleet, together with your battery fleet, as providing you that reserve margin 24-7. And you should actually get paid for that. Currently, we have what we call spinning reserves. So you're running a, a gas, uh, sorry, a coal-fired power station with a turbine spinning, but the clutch pushed in. So it's a spinning reserve. If you need something to come on immediately, you pop the clutch. And if anyone's ever worked on a gold mine on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock in the afternoon, you'll know what I mean when I say you pop the clutch. Okay, so, so it's kind of like wasteful because you're having to burn the coal but not use it. Whereas in the gas case, it's stored and you only switch it on when you need it and switch it off when you don't need it. Like cooking with gas. Well, there's, there's <coughs> cooking. This is second round. Um, I see a hand in the gentleman, gentleman with the blue shirt. Another one there. It's, uh, one at the back, one there, and one here. Okay. Um, uh, thanks for a great uh, event. Luke Hutchinson, Jabeli Brothers. Uh, Chris, thanks for reminding us to switch off our smart TVs and or unplug smart TVs and, and uh, phone chargers. But I think we understand uh, death by a thousand cuts. And if we look, well, I counter what you're saying. Um, if you go to Sassel, uh, they're flaring gas. I was there earlier this year. Um, and I understand from a colleague there was that they had a plan to generate off that gas and that plan got shelved. So my question is, uh, across South African industry, how many of such projects are on the shelf or need to be done feasibility studies? And is anything being enabled such that that can uh, happen because we have a generation issue? Thank you. Let's do Chris. Well, let's do the, the panel. I think Chris brought up the topic. Oh, OK. All right. There was a hand here. Um, thank you, uh, Malcolm Independent. Um, I, I, I do th want to thank you for a very thought-provoking presentation. However, power system is not only controlled by matching supply and demand, clearly. Um, we're not only focusing on steady state, and I think um, our previous gentleman in the white alluded to that. So there are reliability services that we do require, dynamic response, which is not being catered for at the moment. And clearly we need some regulatory reform, policy reforms required to unlock that potential because clearly the technology enhancements is already available in the national market. So, question to Chris, um, is that stimulus really going to play out in the South African context? The second question really to the panel and maybe to Stefan um, is, Clearly within the new IRP, there's an unconstrained connection happening where one to 10 megawatts will create interesting challenges and pr the advent of prosumers will be an additional challenge. What is the international trends around DSOs considering the voltage constraint and obviously congestion challenges that we'll be experiencing in the future with a truly unconstrained condition? And if you allow PV just to be connected, it creates a safety hazard and also interesting technical challenge for the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, there was a hand there. 
was a hand there. I, I will recognize you, Jeff. Uh, there was a hand at the back and the one there. Yeah. So, was there another hand this side? This one. I think we'll just close it off with six sides. There is an agent here. But afterwards, no, 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 not you. The man at the back. Otherwise, we're getting into a stampede. Thank you. That were some very excellent ideas that came out. My name is Rob Jeffrey, economic consultant, former MD of Econometrics. This country needs economic growth, industrialization growth, reindustrialization, and mining growth. That it needs certainty of supply. So the two questions really are modeling is one thing and you model under certainty. The real world is uncertainty. Just a small point. One mentioned 7% is the use of gas, but there was also the mention that we could go for one, two, three weeks. The gas storage is enormous, and I believe that there, or I'd like an answer as to whether there is certainty of switching supplies sufficiently quickly uh, to maintain certainty of supply. And the second aspect, has anybody really done a macroeconomic study of what, a uh, socioeconomic study of what is the economic impact of making such a switch from essentially a mining orientated country. One has a vision of ghost towns uh, spread across the reef. We will keep buried something like 10 trillion rands worth of uh, coal. Uh, and also possibly uranium if people get their way. And uh, it would appear to me that has that study been done, but apart from the fact that we have immense uh, land, how much land is used and for, for wind turbines and what is the environmental damage that they will cause? Thank you. So, um, Rob, I, uh, who would you want these questions to be answered by? You answer both. Yes, sir. Uh, good day, my name is David. I'm from Regen Energy Solutions. Um, we represent the next disruptive technology in ultra capacitors in South Africa. And my illustrious learned partner here has done development of products for that will probably become mandatory in South Africa, like the dead safety lock. What I'd like to know is, um, Clyde, Clyde, you proposed a solution that is a very feasible solution. If we look internationally at Australia, Germany, uh, America, with all its multiple countries within America, they have done a million different methods of solving this problem already. Why do we relearn this? We can just propose the solution which I proposed that we do go the route which is the most feasible and most environmentally correct route and implement that as of now. If we can somehow get our um, nurse to propose this to our government, Chris, I don't know how we get it through because it looks like what gets implemented is exact opposite of what makes good logical sense. Thank you, David. Uh, there was a hand here. We've got the mic, and we'll give the last one that can then we close this. No? Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Les Lana from Cezana Solutions. Um, question to Clyde and possibly uh, Stefan. Um, the IRP is allowing about 2,000 megawatt for additional new storage. And if I listen to what's been spoken today, uh, it may sound like that that's not enough, unless the 3,000 uh, megawatt of gas diesel is, is seen to be with that. It's going to add about uh, 23,000 megawatt of renewable energy. So I just want to know if that ratio is correct, if, if what is from your graphs, if it, uh, the storage will be enough to cover that. Thank you. Yes. My name is. 
My name is Khatola Mwesheng from Pawamatla. My question is related to the two questions posed by the gentleman with the, with the blue shirt, but I think it was around co-generation. And I will address the question to Clyde. Particularly as you answer that question of co-generation, the way I understood it, if you can tilt towards the cement industry and the steel manufacturing, please. Thank you. Looks like it's your round now, Clyde. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first point I want to address is the is how much coal we've got left in the ground. Um, if you look at Friday's Mail and Guardian, the one that's coming up, I've written an article about fool's gold. For the last 20 years of apartheid, we mined gold, but we actually mined oil because we needed to trade oil for we needed to trade oil for gold during the embargo. Um, I come from the Eastern Cape and we tried pineapples and we didn't get anywhere they wanted gold. <laughs> so, so we sank a whole lot of non-economic gold shafts in the 80s. And during that last 20 years running up to apartheid, um, in 1973 the gold mining industry supplied 14% of the total tax take of the country. By 1993 it was only 1%. Guess where the additional 14% came from, and there's a clue in the numbers. The introduction of VAT and GST. So the whole country was taxed to support the gold mining industry that should have been in natural decline, but was propped up for 20 years to supply gold for us to be able to trade for oil. That's the first point. The second point is the coal mining industry has hit its peak already and it's on the decline. And the only difference there now is that you don't stop mining gold or coal because there's still some left. You stop because there's better alternatives. In the case of South Africa, the better alternative was democracy. In the case of South Africa, as it now stands, the better alternative is renewables and a healthy lifestyle for the country going forward. So we don't necessarily have that 12 trillion tons in the ground because it will probably cost us 13 trillion rand to get it out of the ground. So the other interesting thing is that uh, the existing coal fleet and many of the coal mines are operating basically on an operation and maintenance basis, management operation. They've been constructed already, they've been capitalized. So it's like an old car, you're not paying off your, your payments, you're just running your operational costs. If we replace that coal fleet with a new renewable fleet, the country will experience a massive increase in capital expansion and expenditure to build this new fleet. And you will then also have increasing numbers of operation and maintenance jobs. But it's the build of this replacement fleet that looks to absolutely create many more jobs than will be lost in the, in the likes of Pullen's Hope and elsewhere. And I, I recently wrote an article in the Mail and Guardian saying that not many people realize this. Mpumalanga gets 3% three, 3 more sunshine in the winter than the Northern Cape. So how's about we put a whole lot of solar in Mpumalanga to create construction and operation jobs for those who are going to lose their jobs associated with the shutting down of the coal fleet. And it actually produces more electricity in winter when we need it most, where we've got the biggest seasonal difference between summer and winter than the Northern Cape. And of course it's got all the grid infrastructure in place and it's close to the economic, I used to call it the economic heartland. I'm not sure what new term I can use now that's not quite as robust, but anyway. Uh, so that, I hope that addresses some of those questions. We're in for, in, in fact it could, it might even have the potential to save group five if they haven't already been saved. In terms of, we need to build between three and five gigs of solar a year starting tomorrow, and between two and four gigs of wind. That build, is massive and would actually, it would be a rallying point for the country to underpin uh, economic growth potential. I do want to mention one other thing. I've interfaced quite a lot with the trade unions because I believe that they can be perceived as being the, the sand in the gearbox. 
and I'm working very hard at getting the trade unions to actually lead the shutdown of the coal fleet and the coal mines in return for being given some space, given some space to operate and be active players in the replacement fleet and not just to be spectators standing on the sidelines. So that really is, is the underlying policy. And as a country, I believe we need an economic rallying point because there sure as hell aren't any political rallying points at the moment. Sorry, what were the other Can I just, I mean, in essence, I agree with you saying you eloquently put that forward. But I also, we have to also be realistic. I don't think we've just got a government that just wants to be difficult and not want to implement these things. There is social consequences <coughs> to a lot of things and a lot of decisions you make. There's also consequences and costs that you will carry. I mean, you are all it, you know about round one and two, what the cost of that power is costing government at the moment. And that's the first mover, this advantage that you have. One of the gentlemen said then, oh, why don't we just implement what has been implemented in first world countries? We're in a unique, different situation in South Africa. And we have to take those things into consideration. And I think part of the, the narrative should be is yes. I mean, if this is possible to become completely green, to get a, a, a transition period where there's an ability to be able to give people the other opportunity to do something else, and we can incorporate that, that's what has to be done. But firstly, energy is so important for us, cheap energy, well, affordable energy, to be able to get the certainty of that so that there can be manufacturing processes happen, uh, businesses can rely on, on, on an energy. That also all has to be taken into consideration. So, I was also very impressed with the way that you presented, and I think we all want to move in that direction, but there is also an argument that the government is trying to do this in a way that is, in the long term, not going to cost you money, where technology improves, that you do battery storage, for instance, now, and you pay a lot of money for that in three years' time, it's much cheaper, as what's happened to renewable. What risk must an emerging country take to be able to get clean energy compared to what first world should be able to do. And I mean, I'm again talking outside my realm of expertise, but I also, in the argument, I think we have to put that uh, on, on the table. Okay, thanks, um, um, Mr. Khan. Can I just make some further comments? And please, and, and comment on that, because I think it's important that, the, that there's this discussions about that as well. Sure. Yeah, so, so just very quickly, I don't know if anyone noticed that discussion I had with the grid operator took place in 2013 in America. So, in terms of battery storage, we're now six years later. There's already been a massive move. When I first spoke to ESCOM about batteries, the guy kept trying to sell me a triple A or a double A for my torch. He didn't know what I was talking about. Come, I'll be quite honest with you. And at that stage, Duke Energy in Texas already had a 30 megawatt facility way back in 2011 or something. So there has been a lot of learning that's taken place. We're in an incredibly fortunate position in South Africa is that our seasonal differences are nowhere as near. In Finland, you don't want to go there in the winter because the sun never shines. So they have massive seasonal challenges, which we actually don't have. We have really good sunshine, albeit shorter days, but we have really good sunshine. So our diurnal roller coaster, if you can call it that, is a much... Uh, more subdued one in terms of the generation capacity they have between well, our seasonal roller coaster, if I may put it that way. In terms of government involvement, I think Kevin Bloom tweeted recently, what did people think of the IRP? Was it, was it dinosaur or green? And I retweeted him and I said, it's light green with a dinosaur looking over the shoulder. And I didn't specify who the dinosaur was, but we, we, we have it. We have, we have the solutions, we have the heart to do it, but there's still a clinging to want to use stones, although we threw the stone age already. There seems to be a tendency to, to have to use our resources just because we've got them. And the reality is that events have overtaken those resources, so they are no longer resources. A, a, an economic, when you, when you switch from a resource to a reserve, it means that the resources you've got are economically viable. And we've actually crossed the threshold now with electricity <coughs> generation, where the cost of developing a coal resource and a new coal plant 
and using it is more expensive than the alternatives. So those coal resources are no longer able to be transferred into reserves because they don't make economic sense anymore. And just the last point, if you look at my slide deck when you get it, I forgot to highlight it. The replacement models that I showed, the coal, the nuclear, the gas, each one of them gives an indication of the security of supply. And the one that gave no load shedding whatsoever was this one. This one, as we all know, gives us load shedding, trust me, because we're experiencing it as I speak virtually. So in terms of security of supply, this one, as I modeled it, gives no load shedding. And if I'm worried about uh, a shortage anywhere, I jack up some batteries and various things and the price goes from 94 to 96 or whatever it is and I can make it more and more bulletproof as I go along but I, I, I modelled it at a level where I was getting zero occasions where we have no, um, no supply available. So let's give you a break. Um, there were questions to Stefan, to Chris and there was also one from Luke that said to the panel. I'm not sure who's that. Um, sorry. Um, Chris, you want to take yours? Uh, is this uh, everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, uh, I was trying to avoid it. Okay, so I, I think the one from Luke, uh, and I'll make a comment on that, is that um, I don't think we know how many of those types of projects there might be out there, but from our perspective, anyway, is that you are the people that know what proje projects you've got and what the issues are. And if they're not brought to us, we don't generally know about them. I don't know the reasons why Cecil would have shelved that particular project. Um, but, you know, I'll give an example is, uh, you should all know that there is a, um, a framework that allows for special pricing agreements depending on whether you, you, you comply with the requirements. So when we conducted public hearings for, for the ESCOM uh, tariff increases the last time, a lot of presenters came and said, you know, we, we want a special pricing deal, etc. And uh, we went to ESCOM and said, okay, but why are you blocking all these people? And they actually brought us the info that said they had five applications. But the impression we got was there was like hundreds of these particular projects that could benefit and benefit the economy. So, so for me, part of it is for the people with the projects to scream from the rooftops, not the solar PV rooftops, but the rooftops, uh, make a noise. Um, I mean, I think I can also address the one around the ultra caps or super caps or whatever. I know we get people that talk to us about that. Um, we're not the ones that actually do the planning. We make inputs to it. But I think if you're making enough noise, the people that are putting the plan together will recognize it. And I've seen that with some of the other technologies that they've started to look at. I don't know what else was for me? I think it was one about this. Uh, oh, this that's the ultra caps one. So, so as you said, we uh, we make input. So, for example, on the IRP, as NERSA, when it was put out for public consultation, we submitted our comment as if we were one of them. That's what we do. We we don't sit with government and discuss it because that's not. It's really not permitted in terms of our space. We can make our comments and indicate what we feel should be done, etc. Um, I think quite a few years ago, before my time, uh, NERSA used to do the planning. And there is a question as to why don't you actually also do the planning? Um, and that's being discussed, but it's almost like being referee and players. So, I don't know if I've missed anything. So, so if they wanted to talk to NERSA, what's the best way to get you, Chris? I'm sitting here. <laughs> 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 so, uh, and so, so, you know, uh, you can drop me an email or if you don't have access to my email uh, through the NERSA switchboard, I don't know the number, I think it's 4600, 012-401-4600 or on our website, we have a contact centre, um, Chris Helen there will probably be willing to give you my, my email address. Not, not my number. <laughs> <laughs> um, but please contact us, I mean just, you know, phone. Uh, yeah, sometimes I know there are people that have problems, but there are people that, that also know us. That just, I have a lot of people that write me letters. Uh, so I don't run all the, the operational stuff, but I know who to send it to, and then I can also monitor. So the other gentleman that thought he might be outside the law, uh, my, my offer is uh, just send, us a, send me an email, 
and we can see what we can help you with. Cool. Sorry, I can't, I can't leave this, and I, I, I hate to throw a hospital pass or a high tackle, but it seems to be the norm these days. So I was involved with wanting to build 600 megawatts of wind with batteries, and I put an application in for a deviation from the Minister of Energy over two years ago, and I've never got a response. Uh, and at this stage, I can't remember whether the current minister is more devious or less devious than the previous minister. But I haven't got a deviation. So in desperation, I wrote to NUSA about two months ago saying I'm not allowed to build energy in South Africa. What do I need to do to get a license to export electricity to neighboring countries? And I'm sad to say I haven't had a response yet. Well, they buy it from there. From so the I, want to, I want to export electricity. Oh, so that they to can buy it from them then? No, well, I'll export to Namibia, but I'm, I'm not allowed to build, to sell into my own country that has got load shedding. So I said, okay, well, what license do I need then if I want to build and sell to a neighbour who's also battling with load shedding? And I'm afraid I haven't had a response yet. So sorry about that hospital pass, but I, I, got special, I got specially directed to the very person who was apparently going to be able to give me an answer to this, and I haven't had a response yet. So I, 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 I'm using the opportunity that you afforded to, <laughs> to, to, and I don't mean to put you on the screen. So the team is sitting there, I'm sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. No, so so I, mean, I think those are issues that yeah. have to be dealt with. Uh, I think one of the things for this is that for electricity anyway, we, we don't regulate beyond the borders of South Africa. Um, there is an issue with export of electricity and you need permission to do that, etc. Uh, but I guess the trick is you first need permission to build the generation capacity in the country. Uh, the one thing I did want to, to, to make a comment on around that, Clyde, uh, uh, is that, um, you know, if this stuff is so efficient and so cheap, etc., a lot of the regulations and the, the law that's been put into place is if you want to be grid connected, now, I attended, I don't know, it was another conference, but where they actually, you can go to the website, I forget the name, but I'll send it to Chris. And you can go and look at this hybrid system that's been set up. It's a small island, but it's probably maybe the size of Johannesburg in terms of consumption and demand. And they're running gas, wind, battery, etc. And they, they don't, they're not connected to any other grid. Now, if you were running your own, I suppose the mini or micro grid is not connected to the ESCOM grid. A lot of these regulations don't apply to you. No, uh, the other one I think was a question about cogen. Um, in terms of these new regulations, if you're co-generating for own use, you actually don't have a limit on the size of the, the plant. So instead of, if, you know, if, if you're co-generating to sell into the grid with ESCOM, then that's another story because they will want certain things in place to allow you to connect. But a lot of the stuff is, and I'm not uh, advocating succession of the grid, but if it is, and it's, it's more efficient, cost-effective, etc. and you can do it reliably <coughs> on your own, as you say, with a gas plant that can fill in those gaps, you don't need the grid. Because a lot of the, the times you're using renewables, you're using the grid as your backup to really supply in the gaps, currently. But if you can do all of that, um, I don't want to expose anyone, but whoever lives in Waterfall, yeah, uh, they have a gas reticulation system. They've got mass gas storage, they use it for cooking, uh, I think it's underfloor heating. Um, I'm not sure for, for storage water heating. But what if that were to be something you could purchase the gas from them to run a, a gas generator? I don't know if it's cost effective. But I'm saying those are the things you could actually do. And it might be nice to see some mini hybrid system working that's actually cheaper than the grid currently and more reliable. Because that would also be a proof of concept that one could uh, show to government. Government likes that. If you can show them a proof and it's working, etc. But if you tell them, I've modeled this, I've modeled that, it's also a thing, well, we've also modeled it. And their models come out differently. And it's all in the assumptions you make. So, so, so some of these things, um, I did want to make a comment on the socioeconomic. I think it was Rob, if he was up there, that mentioned it. Um, you know, when I was in government, uh, and they, they spoke about the nuclear program, and then we saw all the earth lives, etc. I actually said to them when they did the first IRP, because I was involved in that one, is, yeah, you can have the plan, but these NGOs will keep you in court forever, and you will never be able to implement it. And while you have it in your plan, it's 
it's, it's deferring something else, you never get it in place, and by the time you start on the other one, you're short of the capacity. Okay, so, so some of these things, um, can you imagine if we went with all the renewables and you had all the coal miners in the streets? What will that do to our economy, international investment, etc.? Those are the things the government has to consider. I'm not government, but those are the things they have to look at. <coughs> by going this route, and it does look great on paper, you could actually dump the country into chaos. And not because there isn't a good case for the renewables and because it could be cheaper. That's why they talk about this just energy transition. I'm not sure you can have a just energy transition, but maybe you need to look at the most just that we can get to a just energy transition. I can't let that go. We can have an incredibly <laughs> just transition. We really can. It, 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 it's job accretive, not job lossing. So it's, 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 it, it ticks all the boxes, basically. I have, I have to be the referee here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There was a question that you needed to answer. You um, I, I think there was a question on, um, on the impacts of, uh, of uh, rooftop solar. Uh, yeah, and the DSOs, intentionals. Yes. There's a question by Malcolm. Malcolm, do you recall your question? Yeah? yeah. So, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, it, it really focuses around the interesting challenges that we will experience on the grid with the unconstrained, i.e. increase from one megawatt now to 10 megawatt, on the distribution network where voltage and congestion problems will be a significant issue. Other countries approach it why they create actually distribution getting involved in a system operation duties in managing renewables, in managing how they trade amongst, i.e. the single buyer versus at the virtual power stations. What is your view and trend and maybe also the regulator's view on a distribution system operator considering majority of these connections will be on a distribution network? Um, I think uh, my, my experience is more from, from the European perspective where, where this, uh, this, this has been available, especially these type of uh, smaller scale uh, rooftop solars, uh, prosumer uh, business models. And uh, the regulation is, is there uh, just stating that, okay, anyone can do this, anyone can build and export and, and trade. Uh, and uh, then, then there's a question, uh, does it make sense to build also behind a meter energy storage? Uh, I think uh, that's not something I have seen <coughs> as a major breakthrough yet. Uh, and, uh, and it's probably because in, in Europe, uh, everybody can sell to a power exchange where the price is fairly competitive. Uh, so energy storage is, is maybe not yet broke, broke through for that reason. Um, I'm not sure here in, in, uh, in South Africa what the regulation says uh, about these things, but um, uh, I think overall um, the, the distribution uh, needs to follow the same type of balancing uh, as, as, the, as the system operator. I um, don't know if you have any uh, views on <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so, not at the distribution level, but I know at the transmission level, uh, when, when ESCOM currently submits an application to us, they also submit a proposal for ancillary services. So they ask for certain budgets, etc. Um, I didn't get the gentleman's name, but I, I thought you said the, the, the resources are already available around. It just kind of needs to be, how shall we put it, uh, secured. Uh, or purchased. And, and actually the system operator would do that. They would tell us what they want to do and what it might cost. Um, obviously there might be regulations if it's not existing about um, how they procure. So they might need to go out on some kind of inquiry, etc. But they do. They actually ask us for money and they say this is what it's going to cost us to do um, and this is what we need to do. So if there's some of these other resources around, it would be for the system operator to essentially approach us and say, look, we need to include this. Or if they come up with something now and they say, look, we want to include this, we want to do this, this is actually going to halve our ancillary services cost. And we approve it. That means in the next RCA, a clearing account, effectively it would be a credit to the consumer in that account. At the moment, it's always the other side. 
where this school applies, they would actually credit the community. So they can do these kinds of things. It's not, it's not an impossibility. The distribution side, I don't know. Colleagues, uh, um, clearly we, we need more time, but uh, um, I, I don't know where to buy more time. So um, we've, got, we've got these pertinent issues that we have to be talking about. Unfortunately, we do not have much time. Um, I'm going to ask that we wrap up. We've got five minutes to, to, to wrap up uh, from this end. Stefan, <coughs> give up your closing remarks, uh, we'll, we'll do it like that. Okay. Uh, my take on today, I mean, very interesting, uh, also in someone that has, uh, is also new to this space. Uh, clearly, a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. Um, and, and a lot of good ideas come out and gas clearing. Why aren't we taking some of these things off the shelf, stop doing it? Why aren't we uh, pushing more for, for certain private sector solutions uh, that can happen. Maybe, as you said, some examples of mini grids and stuff that stands on their own. Interesting stuff that we can help the government who's got the ob obligation to be able to give power to the people and to the economy grow. This is the essential tool for this economy to grow. We have to fix it. We have to get the right path to go forward. And I want to believe that the clean route is the best. And I want us to go 100% to that. But I also want us to be do it as a South African, that we do it in a very responsible manner, taking into consideration the social aspects of it, addressing that, getting our power down, and getting CO2 down. And there's also international developing institution other people are prepared to help us in this transition and have got experience in some of these things. Take that on board and let's do it. Thank you, Stephen. Let's do it. Okay, okay just to, to, to summarize then some of the things that I didn't mention because I was speaking mainly about flexible generation. I think I spoke about the coal fleet disappearing overnight and it's, it's quite nice to put it into absolute context though. If the, if the coal fleet did disappear overnight and we replaced it with that new coal fleet, or we replaced it with the fleet I've recommended, the, the solar wind battery storage, the coal fleet would cost our economy 100 billion rand per year more to finance, operate and maintain than the renewable fleet. That's 100 billion rand per year more. If we replaced the coal fleet with a nuclear fleet, it would cost us 200 billion rand per year more to finance, maintain and operate than a renewable fleet. So that's the first take home point. Now, if I dial back five years ago, the coal fleet would have cost us 100 billion rand per year less than a renewable fleet backed by storage. So over a period of five years, there's been a 200 billion rand change in the dynamics, and I don't think people have woken up to that. We've taken nine years to do our RP update that was meant to be updated every second year. The rate of change is such that it's just an absolute travesty of justice that we took so long to put new numbers into our models. I agree that Models with bad numbers can give bad answers, but boy, take the numbers that we had nine years ago and put them in models and say those, those are the only ones we're allowed to use because the new RP hasn't been sanctioned yet and you don't get the same answers. So that's, that's, that's incredibly important. The other thing is that my take on this is that we should use the transition to effect a transformation of the energy supply industry. And ownership of this new fleet should be vested in the people of the country rather than in the government of the country. And so I would like to see I would like to see ownership of this fleet essentially held by people's pension funds where the the pension beneficiaries of the sale of electricity from this fleet would flow to, to a, a, a large number of uh, people with, within the country. And I can assure you, um, when it comes to financial modeling, it's actually much easier than climate or, or techno-economic modeling. 
you can return at least two percentage points more to those people if they invested in a new fleet than they're currently getting through the Government Employees Pension Fund or the ESCOM Pension Fund. And I'd like to propose that the ESCOM Pension Fund take a lead role in this. As a final point, how do we deal with the albatross of the 500 billion and counting that ESCOM owes? And I would suggest if we as a country went to the nations of the world and said we're shutting our coal fleet down in a systematic, responsible fashion over the next 10 years, toss us a couple of bones with regard to our credit rating. And for every notch we go up in credit rating, we save 20 billion a year on government debt. So we just need two notches and we've got the ability to service the 400 million that we owe from ESCOM. So that's what I would suggest to get rid of that debt is toss us a credit rating bone, but on the back of the fact that we've got a concrete plan that we're offering you. So you're not from the World Bank, are you? So <laughs> He looks moody enough to... Uh, Thanks a lot, Clyde. Thanks. Some very tasty bones to chew. Okay, yeah, I agree with, with what, uh, what's been said. Uh, I, I think uh, what, what uh, eventually is, uh, is happening is, is um, uh, renewables are, are here to stay they're not they're not going to disappear uh, and uh, and I understand it's not just economic uh, driven decisions you have to look at social aspects um, but luckily this will not happen overnight uh, coal will not disappear uh, that quickly but over a period of five to ten years I think uh, also renewable technologies you have uh, other technologies power to gas which uh, which will uh, they, they will eventually also start cr to create new jobs and, and I think that the kind of transition is, is important to, to keep in mind that uh, economies evolve and, and I think the, the quicker we learn to adapt to that, uh, the easier our lives will be. Um, the other aspect is also, um, uh, it's not simply that uh, each country lives in, in isolation from, from elsewhere. Uh, we have institutions like World Bank, IFC and other, other uh, development institutions that simply force countries to change because they, they no longer finance as coal uh, and they don't finance HFO and soon they, they will also start uh, pushing uh, ga natural gas away and, and uh, a, lo a lot of the European institutions they, they only finance renewables that's it, <coughs> fossil fuels are out completely and, and this puts us uh, in, the, in the thermal fossil business in a, in a very difficult situation. We have to adapt, and, and the same goes for the country. So uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's something that uh, needs to be recognized, and we need to plan to make uh, an orderly uh, change in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the system. So that would be my main takeaway. Thank you for very much, uh, Stefan. Please, Stefan. Um, okay, so well, I think the one thing, and Clyde mentioned some big numbers of capital investment numbers, and, and I guess the other side of it is also is the, the great investment that will be required to enable all of this stuff. Um, you know, from a regulator's perspective, whether it's renewables, whether it's the coal or whatever, um, and as well as the grid issues, etc., it's about um, what is the best solution, most cost-effective, reliable, etc., to provide the required electricity or energy to the consumers that need it and to drive the economy. So that's really where we come from. So, so as I said, we're technology agnostic. Um, it's really about the business case. If the information presented here today is, is really uh, correct, those business cases will come to the fore and these things will happen. So, I mean, we, and we can see it happening already. Um, no, I think the socio-economic thing is obviously uh, the one thing that, that does concern me a bit um, about the investment in capital in this new renewable age, let's call it, or replacing the grid, is if we don't solve the, the other problems we've got, so for example, 
sorry for the municipality issue and the collection of revenue and so what happens if you invest your pension money in these projects you need to recover the money uh, and the people aren't paying and there's no revenue to pay you am i going to lose money on my pension we need to sort all of these issues out because at the moment when escom doesn't have money etc you see what's happening they've got cash flow issues government needs to step in it's probably us as taxpayers that, that are bearing the brunt um, those are some of the questions that, for me, if I was looking at a project that came to me as the regulator, I would be assessing those risks and saying, so how are you going to cater for the risk of not having the revenue stream when you need it, or cash flow, etc.? cetera? Um, and then, uh, I think, just from my side, just uh, in terms of NERSA, uh, you know, there is something I've been toying with, and I think these types of seminars really bring it home for me, is that as the regulator, we tend to be quite reactive policy comes out, uh, the IOP comes out, and then we work on the regulations around that. Uh, where we often don't look is to see so what's coming in the future and what should we actually be working on today because it might be you know, in the battery stuff. Um, I think I got a letter from somebody, one of the municipalities, must be about a year and a half ago. They said we want to put in battery storage as part of our system uh, and then we didn't really know how to deal with it. But, as you can see, the grid code has only been worked on now to be published early next year. Um, so, so, I think watch the newspapers. What we probably will be doing, I hope, next year, early next year, is, is having some kind of a, a nurse colloquium or a seminar where we can invite people such as you uh, that can bring, bring to the fore for us those issues that we haven't thought about yet, that are going to need regulation or that need regu regulatory clarity um, and we can then put that into some kind of program and we can start working on that as we go. So, so that's something that I think we need to work on as this. So we tend to react. Um, and sometimes not very fast, sometimes we can do it fast. Um, but uh, in Clyde, I'll make sure you get a response. <laughs>